Hello and welcome back. Last time I had a look at the three basic non-isolated parse supply topologies, the bug, the boost and the inverting bug boost. Now these are all great, but there's a slight problem with them. You can either get a voltage, an output voltage that is smaller than your input, so the case of the bug, or you can get an output voltage that is always larger than your input, like the case of the boost, or you can get an either higher or lower voltage than your input, but of the opposite sign. So negative voltages, like with the inverting bug boost. So a problem arises. What can you possibly do if you want a power supply that can give you an output voltage that is either higher or lower than your input, but without the negative sign? So a sort of an inverting bug boost that is not really inverting. Well, you've got a few choices. First of all, you can do a boost connected to a buck. So basically something like this. So two different power supplies connected one back to back to the other. But if you want to do something like this, then you will need one control unit to signal your boost and then another control unit to signal your buck. So you need two separate power supplies. Now this will work, it's actually used in practice, but it's quite complicated and needs quite a lot of components. So is there anything better you can do? Well, yes, there is. And it looks a like this. So it's called the two switch buck boost. Basically, it's quite similar to the, to the separate buck and boost converters. But this time you only need a single inductor. So you replace the two inductors with a single one and then you just rearrange the switches and the diodes. So depending on what you need, you either use your first switch and you always keep the second switch open and you got yourself a buck circuit or you always keep your first switch on and then you switch your, your second switch and you got yourself a boost. So you got both the buck and the boost in the same package. Now you can go one step further to create the four switch bug boost in which both the diodes are also replaced by switches, which would be much more efficient. But again, the control circuit will be very, very complicated. But what I want to talk to you about today is neither of these two. What I want to go into are some other topologies that use only a single switch and pull off the same bug boost type behavior. What I'm talking about, of course, is the CPIC and the Zeta power supply topologies. And while we're at it, we'll also look at the non-isolated chook. So if you're curious, then keep watching. So let's start with the CPIC power supply. Now this name actually comes from single-ended primary inductor converter. Let's see what it looks like. Basically, you take a booster, so you got your typical inductor switch and diode from the booster, and then you add another capacitor and an inductor. So the first thing that you might notice about this supply is that you have this capacitor, meaning that no matter what you do, when you turn off this supply, your input and the output is completely isolated. You can't get any current either in a direct way or an indirect way. So this is the first interesting feature of this supply. Now let's see from a load and generator point of view how the two states of the supply work when the switch is on and when the switch is off. So let's start simple. When the switch is on, we are getting power from our input capacitor through our switch charging our input inductor. So our capacitor will be a generator, our inductor will be a load. Now when the switch is open, our input capacitor is still a generator and the current going through our inductor stays the same, but this time it turns into a generator and this current goes to charge our isolation capacitor, so this one becomes a load this time, and it closes through our output diode and through our output capacitor. Now if we go back to the first stage a bit, we can see that when the switch is closed, our isolation capacitor turns from load to generator, so polarity stays the same but direction of current reverses, and in this on stage of our switch, our isolation capacitor is used to charge our second inductor. So we will have a current flowing through this inductor, charging it, so this will be a load. And now if you go back to our second diagram, this is why I left no current in the second inductor. The second inductor turns from load in the first stage into generator in the second stage. So part of the current going through the output capacitor and load will be coming from our input, part of it will be coming from our second inductor, which will be a generator. Now depending on how you want to build this supply, you can use the two inductors completely separate, or you can use them as a transformer so to have the two inductors coupled. But the supply will work in either case. But when you couple them, you will get higher efficiency. And the output capacitor is a load and generator in our second analysis when it's providing the necessary current to our output load. So taking in current if too much is coming in and then providing if not enough is being supplied. And in our first case, it's purely a generator. Now let's talk a bit about the output voltage for this supply. 
If we look at our open switch situation, we can see that our output voltage is our input voltage plus the voltage on L1 and minus the voltage on our isolation capacitor. So we can see that our polarity of our voltage on this isolation capacitor is in reverse compared to our current going through it. Therefore, our output voltage can either be higher or lower than our input voltage depending on what the total of this difference will be. If the voltage on our capacitor is higher than the voltage on our inductor, then this sum will be negative, therefore our output voltage will be lower than our input. If on the other hand the voltage on the inductor is higher than the voltage on the isolation capacitor, then this difference will be positive, meaning that our output voltage will be higher than our input. And of course we can also factor in the voltage on our diode, but we can neglect that. So let's just see this thing in a simulation, see if all of this actually works out. So I got my circuit right here and now before starting to simulate I just want to point something out regarding all of these supply simulations is that I'm not simulating from the beginning of time. So we can see here if I go into my simulation command editor that I'm starting to save data only 30 milliseconds after startup and then I will save only for 100 microseconds. So why am I doing this? Well, it's important when analyzing such circuits to perform the analysis at steady state, meaning that all of the voltages and currents have reached a certain average, so you're no longer having any sort of variations. So let me just show you what I'm on about if I don't start the simulation at a certain point in time. So I will start at zero and then simulate for 100 milliseconds. So now if I look at my output, we can see that it goes from zero, as expected, jumps up and then proceeds to stabilize at a certain point. So we can say we have reached steady state when our output is constant. Now you may see that here at the beginning we had a certain jump. And this is an easy way of explaining why in my last video I ended up having a circuit with more than 100% of efficiency. I was analyzing it in this area of operation. So a lot of energy was stored in the circuit at the beginning of the startup phase and this energy is being released afterwards. And that means that less energy is being taken into the system, so from the power supply, then it's pushed into the output, since the rest of it is coming from the energy stored in the coils and the capacitors. Okay, now that being said, let's actually perform our simulations. And let's start by analyzing the switch. So I'm measuring at the moment the switch input signal, and we can see that during the on phase, the current through our input coil is rising, so the coil is being charged, and then in the off phase, the coil is being discharged. Therefore, we have certain voltage in our switch node, so in the drain of our transistor, that is zero when our switch is on, and we have 20 something volts when our switch is off. So basically, this is working like a booster. Now, let's move on a bit. We know that our output voltage is stable around 11 point something volts. That means that before our diode, we have a voltage slightly higher. So it's just a bit higher than this 11 point something volts. It's around 12, 12 volts. That means that on our capacitor we have a voltage of around 10 volts. So between this cyan marker and the red marker is our voltage on our isolation capacitor. And this voltage is maintained depending on our switch position. So even when the switch is on we have this voltage difference, even when the switch is off we have this voltage difference. Now at the moment our output voltage is slightly higher than our input, so our input is 10 volts, our output is 11. Now if I play around with the duty cycle, so the on and off time, we can show that we can get both higher and lower voltages than our input. So just to show higher voltage I will give a much bigger on time, so 15 microseconds out of 20. This gives an output voltage of around 30 volts, so much much higher than our input. And in the same way we can make lower voltage by making a lower than 10 microsecond on time. So at 5 microseconds on time, we get only 5 volts at the output, 5.6. So we can get both higher and lower voltages than our input, depending on our duty cycle. Next up, we got the Zeta topology. So basically we got the same components that we did with our Cephic, but this time the supply is not based around a boost converter, but rather a buck. And that can be obvious if I just block these two extra components. So we got our basic buck, with an extra inductor and capacitor. So again, let's analyze this circuit in two phases. So in our first phase, we've got current coming from our input capacitor, charging our input inductor, so our first inductor. And now if we move to our second phase, so when the switch is open, we can see that our inductor turns from load in our first case into generator. So the current 
keeps the same direction but the polarity will change. Now this current will close through the diode and this will charge our isolation capacitor with a certain voltage. Now if we move back for a moment to our first situation, our isolation capacitor is charged with the voltage and we can get the current coming from our input and go through our isolation capacitor. So in this direction, our isolation capacitor turns from load in the second case into generator in the first case. And basically we got a buck. So our second inductor will become a load and the current will close through our output capacitor. So we have a really, really big loop going on like this and charges our output with positive voltage. Now again, if we move back to our second situation when the switch is open, our second inductor goes from load to generator so current maintains the same direction but the voltage changes polarity and again the current will close through our diode supplying our output capacitor. So in both cases our output capacitor works both as a load and as a generator depending on the current coming through the inductor and the current needed to supply the output load and we can see that we have quite a complicated way of transferring energy from the input to the output. And this is basically the problem that we'll, we will see with all of these topologies so all three of them that I'm talking about today. The response time is much slower compared to the basic buck and boost and inverting buck boost. And the response time is slower because of this complex way of taking energy from the input to the output. Now coupling the inductors will help to speed this up a bit. But as I said, we can both work with coupled inductors or uncoupled inductors. Now, if we talk about our output voltage, best case is to analyze the first situation. We can say that our output voltage is our input voltage, so the voltage on C1, plus the voltage on our isolation capacitor. So we can see that this time the isolation capacitor is generator and the voltage polarity is in the right order. So we add it up to our input voltage and then we subtract the voltage on our second inductor. So again, based on the values of these two voltages, this difference can either be positive or negative, meaning that our output voltage can either be higher or lower than our input voltage. So let's see this topology in action in a simulation. So here I got my zeta converter and let's see what this thing is doing. So we can see that the output voltage is fairly stable so we have reached steady state and it's at 12.3 volts so at the moment it's giving us a higher voltage than the input so it's boosting. So let's look a bit at the currents going through the circuit. So we see that we're pulling energy only when our switch is on. So during the on time of the switch, current is going through the transistor. This current is partially charging our inductor. So you can see that not all the current going through the switch actually goes through the inductor. The rest of it goes through the capacitor and onwards to the load. So the sum of these two currents, so the red inductor L1 current and the psi n capacitor current is the total current coming into the supply. Now during the off period of the switch, we can see that all the current going through the inductor ends up going through the capacitor. So the inductor is being discharged into the capacitor. Also we can see that the voltage in the cathode of our diode during the off period is at zero. So we have a closed circuit right here. So that means that all of our inductor energy is being discharged into the capacitor. Now again, if we look at the on time only, we see that the current that's going through our capacitor also goes through our second inductor. So again, during the on time, all the current going through the capacitor goes into the second inductor. And during the off time, the second inductor current partially goes into the output capacitor and partially into the output load resistor. So again, our output capacitor is working like a buffer, the sum of the two currents being the output current. Now let's just check our efficiency. So we've got 1.56 watts, 1.5. 57 watts of output power and we got an input power of 1.97. So the rest of the power being dissipated on our input switch and on our diode. Also, if we play around with the duty cycle, let's just put a very high duty cycle. So 50 microseconds on time out of 20 microseconds period, we get a very high output voltage. So around 47 volts. So we can definitely boost with this circuit. Now, if we put a smaller on time, so only five microseconds out of 20, we get around six volts. So we're decreasing the input voltage. So this supply can both increase and decrease the input voltage. So let's move on. Now the final converter I want to talk to you about today is the non-isolated Chuk converter, named after Slobodan Chuk. And what I want to talk to you about is the non-isolated version. So there's an isolated version of this converter, but let's just analyze this since it's in team with all the other converters we looked at today. So this is what the converter looks like. Again, same components but a different arrangement. So let's analyze the currents going through this circuit. In our first situation, we're gonna get current coming from our input, charging our first inductor. And if we go to our 
Second situation when the switch is open, the energy stored in our first case when the switch was closed now is being discharged so our inductor turns from load to generator, current direction is maintained and this current is used to charge our isolation capacitor. So our isolation capacitor will become a load this time. Now if we go back to our first case, the isolation capacitor turns from load to generator and we will have a current going through it, through the switch and closing through our output capacitor and our second inductor. So we will have again a negative voltage on our output. So this is an inverting topology. The output voltage is negative in reference to our input and we also have our second inductor as a load being charged. Now finally we can go back to our second case with the open switch and this time the second inductor turns from load to generator so the direction of the current stays the same, the voltage polarity changes and this is used to charge our output. So we always get supply to our output capacitor and load both in the on and off cases of our switch transistor. And basically this is what this brings special compared to the inverting bug boost. Although both topologies give us negative voltage and the voltage that can be higher or lower than our input, with the chuck converter we are constantly pulling energy from our input so it's much less noisy and we're constantly putting energy into our output so again much less noise. Although it's a more complicated design and a bit more difficult to control and stabilize, it will have much less noise. So it will be much more electromagnetic friendly to your design. So let's see this circuit in action in a simulation. So what I got here is the basic non-isolated true converter and let's just fire it up, see exactly how this thing works. So if we look at the output, we can immediately see that it has a negative voltage. So whereas our input is a positive 10 volt, our output is a negative 11. So now if we look at the currents going through the circuit during the on time of our switch it's charging, during the off time it's discharging and this voltage, so the voltage we got on our inductor is used to charge our isolating capacitor. So we can see that during our discharge phase the current going through our inductor is charging our capacitor so the same current is going through both of them and during the off phase the capacitor is being discharged into the second inductor. So let's just look at these two by themselves. So here we can see that during the on time, so when our first inductor is being charged, our second inductor is also being charged by our capacitor. So we're using the capacitor first to take energy from the input and then to transfer it to the output, so to the second part of our circuit. And because of the way the currents are flowing through our circuit, we get our negative voltage on the output. And also if we play around with our duty cycle, we should be able to see that we can get both higher and lower voltages than our input. So the absolute value of the output voltage should be higher or lower. So with a high on time we will get negative 30 something volts, so much higher than our input. And with a lower on time, so 5 microseconds, we get minus 5 volts. So all these simulations I will leave a link to them in the description, so go check them out if you want to play with these simulations. And that's about it for the non-isolated topologies. So hope you got some useful information out of this, thank you for watching, leave your thoughts in the comments, if you want to be up to date with all my latest videos then please subscribe to my channel and hope to see you next time, bye bye.